I have been doing research in this area since um, around about 1986. I've been involved in marine conservation during all of that time. My PhD was looking at the impacts of uh, sewage outfalls on coastal environments and trying to find ways of mitigating those impacts. Since then, I've been involved uh, in an advisory capacity with uh, the Marine Reserve and both iterations of the different zoning plans for Marine Park. So I've got a fairly intimate knowledge of the Marine Park. Gary gave me a very broad brief for this talk and I thought it was very um, optimistic for 30 minutes. <laughs> so I actually haven't got anything controversial, or particularly controversial in my talk, so I might um, kick something, kick, kick the show off with a, a comment. Um, we've all heard the mantra of no science in marine parks. <laughs> this is basically a lie promulgated by politically motiv motivated and very noisy minority groups. Um, all you have to do is look at some of the publications summarising research in the Solitary Islands and Jarvis Bay Marine Park. Um, the hundreds of publications that have gone into generating a document like this, this is just till 2009, and the accelerating amount of research which is supporting um, conservation decisions here and elsewhere within the state to realise that this really is a lie. Um, that's the only controversial or relatively controversial thing I want to say, but it's probably a good party starter. Okay, so what I'm really going to do today is focus a little bit more on fleshing out some of the information that um, Nicola's already provided to you in terms of the natural values of the marine park. I also want to talk a little bit about how scientists go about getting the information which we use to underpin conservation. And so I'll talk a little bit more about some of the methods that um, Nicola's already mentioned. Give you a little bit of a physical setting. One of the interesting things, or one of the most important things about our setting here, with subtropical. Subtropical is um, is the new black in terms of marine science. We're in a place where climate change is likely to be um, noticed fairly quickly. Uh, we're also in a place where tropical species that have been driven southward by increasing temperatures are likely to find refuge. So we now have an amazing diversity of different institutions and researchers doing work in the subtropics. And we actually have a, a, an alliance of, of universities, um, research groups from across the country, including Western Australia, trying to focus on some specific subtropical research. And here we've got a fantastic water temperature range of a minimum of about 16.6. Just came back from a diving trip to Port Stephens where I think we were below that and I realised why I live up here. Um, up to a maximum about 27.5 and rising. We've got a very high rainfall and that's likely to get worse under most climate change scenarios and that's going to have fairly substantial implications for our marine environment and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on if I have time. Nicola's already mentioned the strong influence of the East Australian current and that combined with the fact we've got islands that, that go across the continental shelf and so intersect different bodies of water of different temperatures carrying different organisms in their larval stages means we have a massive diversity and this really does drive the patterns that we see and I'm going to give you a little slideshow in a moment just to illustrate that. One of the things we've noticed recently, and just a few weeks ago, we had waves breaking over the entire eastern breakwater. Um, in 2009, I'll show you some graphic pictures from the East Coast Low that came through in May, um, with maximum wave heights of 17 metres, which completely devastated some of our coral communities. And these clearly have a major impact on how community structure changes over time. And uh, some people would even argue that in this sort of environment, most communities are in a, a, state, a state of constant recovery, but at different stages of recovery. One of the issues we have, and uh, this is a focus of a research program, I've got a case study here that I threw in, but I'm not going to get to that today, um, is looking at impacts of urbanisation and modification of our terrestrial environments, particularly um, through runoff, um, both through um, stormwater drains and through estuaries, and the impacts that's likely to have um, on our marine communities. And certainly it's, uh, it's something of major concern within the Coffs Harbour area. And I've more or less mentioned that already. So just to give you some idea of, um, we think about the East Australian current as being this fairly continuous stream of, um, of uh, nice warm water that comes down the coast. Just to quickly tell, these are, these are different sites with different distances offshore. North Solitary, these are the furthest offshore, down to Muttonbird Island, which is closest to shore. This is temperature. 
Um, and these are just from data loggers over a, um, a fairly short period of time from the 22nd of February through to the 4th of March in 2007. And you can see we've got this nice pattern of a gradient of increasing water temperature as you move offshore under the influence of the East Australian current. And you can see that um, based on this sort of orangey uh, warm pattern over here. What can sometimes happen though is that we actually get current flows or the strength of the flow and that drives cooler water uh, which upwells um, from uh, deeper areas and you can get these temperature reversals which are really quite dramatic. So we've got a difference of down to 19 degrees up to 26. So we've got a seven degree temperature differential at North Solitary over a period of just a few days. And here we have the re-establishment of the um, the natural, or not the natural, the, the most common pattern. So it's a very, very dynamic environment. Um, and these maxima and minima um, have major implications on survival ability of different organisms. We're anticipating one of the things that's predicted is under climate change, we'll see changes in the way the East Australian current interacts um, with the shelf here, and that may have major consequences in terms of these sorts of patterns. The East Coast low of 2009 was, uh, this is South Solitary, um, never had a particularly high coral cover, but it was next to zero when we did this um, dive back in, uh, well, it was probably just a few days after um, the swell had dropped sufficiently for us to get out there. It was like diving a new site. It had been sand scour, which had removed up to four or five metres of sediment, and all of the coral was just distributed in the, as broken lumps in these um, in the gutters along the northwestern side. So it was quite devastating. It split solitary, large boulders. That's probably a metre and a half across that boulder turned over with and crushing the corals and all the organisms underneath it. So it's a highly dynamic environment um, out there. It's not a benign environment at all. So. Nicholas mentioned we've got um, an overlap between algal dominated, the coral dominated communities have probably attracted more attention than the algal dominated ones, but it's probably in the algal dominated communities that we're going to see the most change um, because kelp is being driven southward as we speak. Um, it's going to re respond very quickly to increasing um, seawater temperatures and also to poorer water quality inshore. Um, it will be driven deeper initially and then we will probably lose it from this area. Now anybody who's walked on a beach, um, a rocky shore after a big storm and has seen the large quantities of kelp that are washed up there will understand that these are really fundamental for the coastal food chains. They break down, they feed a whole range of different organisms. And so this is um, of major concern and something that we're looking at here in some detail. With that obvious difference in temperature across the, um, the, the cross gradient, um, we find very almost predictable patterns across a range of different organisms and we've looked at those in detail for corals where we get increased diversity and increased cover, so the, the percentage cover of coral as we move offshore generally speaking. We get a change in the dominant types of sea urchin for example from um, more temperate distributed species close to shore to the more tropical ones offshore. Um, with the mollusks, exactly the same sort of pattern, but we get an increasing species richness or diversity as we move offshore as well. And for the fish, and I've actually got some data to show you. This is based on, um, Nicola mentioned Hamish Malcolm, who's the research officer, and he's, he's done a lot of work with us here. And this is looking at how um, fish species richness or diversity changes as you move offshore. And you can see we've got a very strong and significant relationship with increasing species richness um, as you move across to the outer islands and these are north, north solitary. If you break that down, whoops, I think I have another, here we go. Um, if you break that down, um, it shows some really interesting biogeographic patterns. So it's not just all species that change, or you know, we're not just picking up new species, we're actually changing the sorts of species we find there. We're getting an increase in tropical species and a reduction in temperate species. Um, one of the most important things, again, under the sort of climate change scenarios is that the majority of the endemic species, which are highly valued in conservation terms, are primarily within those nearshore and mid-shelf reefs, and those are the ones most likely to change if we get increased flooding at least Australian current water and increasing temperatures. So something, again, that um, is sort of ringing a few alarm bells for us at the moment. So now I'm going to take you for a little dive. Um, talked a lot and shown you a lot of figures, but how about showing you some nice pictures? 
Um, so I'm going to take you from a dive from Mutton Bird Island out to North Solitary. And I want to show you the diversity in a pictorial fashion. Um, close to shore, we've got these kelp-dominated forests. Um, you can see the kelp start here. The, um, the bottom is 100% cover with marine organisms. Um, it may not look particularly diverse, but you remove a kelp holdfast or a piece of bryozoan and um, dissect it out. And a single holdfast can support anything up to 500 species and maybe 1,500 individuals. We've got huge biomass and highly productive environments. One of the reasons for that is that while not many things eat the kelp, um, the kelp abrades, small particles of organic material become suspended in the environment, and most of these larger organisms are suspension feeding organisms, which means they suck out that organic material and they thrive in these relatively turbid environments. Um, and in fact, these relatively turbid environments it, um, might seem a bit odd, but are one of my favourite ones to dive because you do get this really, really high diversity of very interesting organisms. Get lots of fish in these environments too, and in fact, a lot of the sites we dive near shore are very popular, particularly for bait fish. And, and we've been on dives where um, you couldn't count the number of bait fish, like these yellowtail. Um, literally, you dive down through them and you hit the reef before you before you can see it. So we've got some um, some high abundances of important species. Um, very pretty dives quite often. This is a little bit further south down at Nambucca, but you can see the sorts of habitat undulating, hard wearing. We've got uh, most of the reefs here are, are comprised of metamorphic rock, which means it's a very firm substratum, um, which allows these, um, these communities, these sessile communities, those that are attached to the bottom, to persist, um, apart from when the storms come along, of course. And we even find some fairly large visitors close to shore. This is in about six metres of water at uh, Mutton Bird Island. That's a, a grey nurse shark there just swimming by. So I mentioned the suspension feeding organisms. They often occupy the majority of the substratum. You've got these um, hydrozoans, these stinging hydrozoans. You've got the sea fans. Um, you've got some sponges down here. And these gorgonians in particular um, provide... Um, habitat for a range of different organisms and the whole of our research project at Port Stephens um, last week was in fact searching through gorgonians for these little shells called allied carriers. I'll show you a picture a bit later on to try and uh, gauge their diversity. Um, yet more, this, this is a, a type of um, um, ascidian or a sea squirt. Um, each individual hole is an individual animal. Um, and then they have these common exhalant apertures, and that makes it very, very efficient for feeding. And they use a muscular pump to, to filter that water. This is the reason I like to dive these habitats. The things that eat them are really, really spectacular. Um, this is a nudibranch, um, just meaning naked gills. They're very, very colourful. Uh, they advertise because they actually contain toxins within their slime or their mucus, and so they can afford to stand out with this, what's known as a posematic coloration. And we get very high diversities of these in particular in these niche or environments. Um, just running through a bunch of different organisms, one of the things I mentioned is we get this overlap between temperate and tropical. Here's a temperate urchin, uh, sorry, temperate starfish um, that generally we find near shore. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute some tropical ones and also some endemic ones which have very restricted ranges. Moving mid-shelf, we, we get out to um, northwest solitary and you can see we're increasing. You can't see any kelp there. In fact, you can't see very, many al uh, very much algae at all. Uh, and what happens here is we get an increasing cover of coral, the hard corals in the foreground, and also those soft corals, those beautiful pink cauliflowers, um, which again are a fantastic habitat for a range of different organisms. Here's one of our endemic species with a very restricted range, just in the subtropics. And another one, um, and this one was actually named after Neville Coleman, whose name some of you will know. He's an underwater naturalist who sadly passed away about it a couple of months ago. Um, again, different types of sea squirts, um, beautiful black corals, which um, support, again, a range of different organisms, including my favourite group. These are the allied cowries I mentioned before. And one of the projects we're doing at the moment is trying to document their biodiversity. Very difficult to get anybody to do that for you, looking at the morphology of the shell, so we're actually having to go to genetic barcoding or fingerprinting to do this. 
And now we're moving into those clearer waters. Generally, as you move offshore, um, you're more likely to get clear water. No guarantees you're going to get clear water. Um, and I don't know what it's like out there at the moment, but you know, anything 30 metres plus um, happens at various times. And there's a, that's just to prove it, and there's our boat. <laughs> Um, and now we start to pick up these tropical species. Some of these urchins, um, quite spectacular. Um, these corals actually have a wider distribution than just um, offshore. But again, when you look closely, you can see they support a really large diversity. Here's a shell that's actually feeding on this polyp here and is now laying its eggs. Um, and what is thought to happen is they get biochemical imprinting so they know how to swim back to their food when they finally become adults, or sorry, when their larvae coming back and about to settle. Um, we get an increased uh, fish species diversity and, um, and often, I haven't got any pictures of the sort of the big balls of fish that we get places like fish soup, which is just a, an absolutely unique site um, within the park, but um, you'll just have to use your imagination. But we still get some uh, tr uh, subtropical endemics. This is, um, this is a, a wide-banded anemone fish, and you'll see some in the aquarium out here. That's actually an endemic, uh, which is likely to be one of those that's um, squeezed quite strongly by increasing seawater temperatures. We also pick up these symbi um, symbionts, or the little commensal organisms that live with a lot of these tropically associated species. Uh, we've got a little uh, porcelain crab here living in one of the giant anemones, or the host anemones that we get out there. Um, little shrimps. Um, so we've got some spectacular stuff. Uh, and some of these other larger shells. Okay. Um, I've probably spent a lot longer on that than I intended to, so I'm going to get into a little bit of the stuff about planning for conservation. Um, in New South Wales and, and in, in fact worldwide, we actually um, we favour the, the CAR principle, Comprehensive Adequate Representative, as a guideline for how we go about marine conservation, how we protect areas. Um, that still underpins the New South Wales model. There have been suggestions that we should go to a threat-based approach, but uh, my argument here is um, CAR is a, basically a threat-based approach. It minimises threats by applying it. What it does is, uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that we, we give adequate protection for all habitats um, that are known to support specific types of communities, and that's how you make the decisions about where you put your protective zoning. For that reason, for a long time now, we've focused our effort on getting background information about species, richness, community types, so that we can actually inform this process. In other words, the question is, where are the conservation gaps? What habitats have we missed in our existing zoning plans? This was the information that underpinned the rezoning that was rolled out very briefly last year and then rescinded. Give you some idea of the sort of research that's been done. This was looking at fish. Um, it was using a combination of underwater visual census methods and also baited underwater video. And it identified very, very strongly that you could, I offshore, you could identify three particular um, community types, inshore, mid-shelf and offshore, and at the same time you could identify different community types based on depth from 0 to 25 metres, 25 to 50 and below 50. So basically under the CAR principle we need to make sure that all of those habitats are protected in sanctuary zoning. Let's have a look at the old plan, and I'm sorry about the size of this text, but the different colours there represent different types of reef, and the two I want you to focus on are intermediate offshore reef and deep reef, um, and you, you can see those around here. Um, under the old plan, only 1% of intermediate offshore reef was actually protected. That's, that does not fit the adequate category at all. And if we look at the deep reef, there was 0% protected. And that was the reason for the extension of sanctuary zones out to the edge of the marine park um, in, in one particular area. And I haven't got that plan here. So you can see that the, the decisions were based on good science. They were based on, on, on good management principles. Um, the decision to rescind them was nothing other than totally political. OK, just very quickly to go through how we collect the data. Um, I don't have a lot of time left. We 
favour diver surveys because we love diving, of course. <laughs> but we recognise that um, there are some inherent limitations of this, and that is time underwater, uh, the fact that some of these sites are very deep, um, and you just cannot generate that information. Um, often you need samples, so you need some method of actually being able to take samples to identify things. Some other things you can identify quite readily remotely. So there's a whole bunch of different remote methods that we use too, and they're increasing rapidly as the technology catches up. Um, we've got grab samples for soft sediments where we remove a known volume or area of sediment and we actually sift that to get the organisms out of it. We've got the baited underwater videos which I'll talk about a bit, um, in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, satellite and photographic images and the resolution of these is, incre is it getting much, much better. Previously we might have pixel sizes of 500 metres which isn't great for planning or even a, a kilometre. Um, but you know, if you pay, pay the DOSH, then you can actually get much finer resolution these days. We've also got, um, Nicola mentioned the autonomous underwater vehicle, which is fantastic. It's got um, high resolution video and stills. It can actually measure the size of things by using stereo cameras and laser sighting. So you can actually get um, not only an indication of what's there, but how big it is. Um, you, then you could, one of the things we always like to do if we can is um, if things are in a state of recovery, it's likely that bigger things are going to be found in areas which have been less impacted. So those are sorts of questions we weren't really able to uh, answer before, but we can now. And we've now got radar arrays at uh, Nambucra and Red Rock, which are providing information on currents um, and a range of other sort of surface, sea surface states, which are going to be very useful for modelling down the track. This is our standard underwater visual census method, usually run a tape out, and this is for our nearshore reef program where we look at fish, um, mollusks, and we do video transects, so we've got a permanent record, and we also pick up all the garbage, and unfortunately that tends to take quite a bit of our time, particularly in the nearshore reefs. Grab sampling, here's our little grab sampler, uh, not so big, it's called Joy because um, it's not a Joy. Um, it's very hard to handle, we had to use a trawler for this one, we actually uh, put that through uh, a sieve mesh size of about one millimeter and uh, and get the information from that um, baited underwater video is something which is now being used worldwide it's a remote method of getting uh, very good information on fish relatively quickly it minimizes the cost because you don't have to spend too much time at sea the principle is simple you've got a video camera in the in the housing over here You've got um, about a kilo of pilchards in a little bag here. You deploy it for 30 minutes and then you look at the video footage to see what comes in. And um, you can actually work out the number of species um, that are likely to be attracted. Now bear in mind this is only going to be species that are either attracted by food or by the traffic of other fish and become curious. Um, you can also get an estimate of their abundance. Um, it's not as simple as counting this because some will keep coming back for more just like humans. <laughs> Other remote methods we have, um, we've mentioned sea surface temperature, but one of the great things you can do with that too is by looking at a different spectral um, wavelength, you can look at ocean productivity or ocean colour as it's called and get an idea of where the, pro uh, the productive areas are. And you can see here that really a lot of that productivity is associated with this, um, the front of the East Australian current on this particular occasion. The autom autonomous underwater vehicle, this is this, um, it's basically, it, it's autonomous. It's actually programmed and it, you let it go and it comes back, you hope, because they're quite expensive. And with lots and lots of cool data. Um, and so it's got a propeller here. It's got um, the cameras here. And this is the sort of image that it's able to produce from, uh, you know, you choose your depth, basically. So we've got this fantastic source of potential information in the future. So just concluding, I, I think I'm going to finish on time. This is rare, trust me. Um, it was the first marine park in New South Wales. It was the largest until we got beaten by one of those southern ones. Um, but w because it's the first, we've got the beauty of having had quite a lot of investment in directed research to actually ensure that it is managed effectively. There is no doubt in my mind that the zoning plan that was put out and rescinded um, was a dramatic improvement in terms of conservation outcomes within this region. And it's just a total shame that, um, that that was rescinded, and particularly so quickly. Um, it's based on excellent scientific information, and I have to say that because I'm doing some of the science, and, 
Um, but it is. We've got we've got long history of, of information from this area, um, and that was what, a, what what alerted the government in the first place to the idea of having some form of marine protection here because it is such a highly diverse area. Um, that information is increasing. However, um, we are concerned that investment in marine science and in directed questions, uh, which will inform this process, really is sort of drying up. And that's where community groups can lobby, um, tell, tell government what questions need to be addressed in order to get effective management. And let's get the right people getting the right data to help us with some of these gaps. Um, I mentioned already that um, the Solitary Islands is really a huge focus at the moment. We've got lots of groups coming down. We really want to focus on protecting these existing communities that we've identified, those that are not currently protected within sanctuary zones. But really what we need to do for the future, and Mark mentioned what are we going to hand on to our kids sort of stuff, um, we need to look at what are some of the potential climate change effects, are there things we can do about that, or can we plan for more effective management down the track if we think that our hot spots at the moment are not going to be hot spots in the future, and that requires a lot of work. One of the best ways we can do this is, is to maximise ecosystem resilience, which means keep our environments in as natural a state as possible. Um, they've got inherent ability to recover. When we add additional stresses over the top of that, like urbanisation, um, stormwater runoff, um, you know, the, the, the decreasing water quality um, and the exploitative activities that occur in many of these habitats, we reduce resilience and we reduce the capacity of the environment to recover. So this is the way forward, maximising resilience. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.